the, um, well, it's, it's a ministry, a 501c3 in and of itself, but our sending church is Calvary Independent Baptist Church in Huntington, Pennsylvania, and we have our board of directors meeting every two years, and, uh, and we set it up. Uh, yesterday was our board of directors meetings. We set it up where in the off years we can do it by, by computer uh, so that we can have a little bit more hands-on on some of the things that are going on. But uh, uh, the Lord's been good to us and has uh, offered us the ability to continue in his work. Um, I remember, and, and this is just a personal note, and I, I hope you accept it as such. Uh, I remember the day that I picked up my dad at uh, the VA hospital in Columbia, South Carolina, and was bringing him home. And on that trip, I, it fell to me. I have four sisters, but for some reason, I was the one that took the responsibility um, to tell him that mom had just been put on hospice. Uh, and what that means, of course, six months to live and, uh, or less and, and all of these different things. And, and so we were driving, and I, I, uh, I said, Dad, uh, the doctors have given us some news about mom. And um, they put her now on hospice care, and uh, that usually means that there's six months or less to live. And I don't remember exactly what month it was, but it seems like she lived about four uh, after that. And he got real quiet for a moment. Now, my dad was a pastor, a godly man, uh, an example to me in my life. He was a church planner here in the United States. Uh, I revered him completely and trusted him. And uh, I saw him get silent for a few minutes. And then he said, Tim, we're not assured that we're going to make it home today. We can be in a car wreck. This is the day that the Lord has given, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And tomorrow's another day. And I thought, wow, what a great lesson uh, for a son who was also suffering with the news that his mom had now been put on hospice. But that has come back to me several times. In the last three years, and even in the last few months, as Teresa has gone through some physical difficulties of her own. Uh, yeah, there are some things out there that uh, can look bad if we just stare at them for a while. But you know what? God has given me today. And I want to rejoice and be glad today. And I want to serve him today. And my message today is going to be much along those lines. In fact, the memory verse that you're using right now, uh, while it's not part of my sermon, is very much an integral teaching of what I want to approach today. Uh, a real blessing. I wrote beside that verse the names of my three sons. Matthew, Michael, and Merritt. My desire for my sons is what that verse teaches. That in some part... The God that I have served will take control of their lives and cause them to desire to serve him. I want to talk today about my heart. Now, many of you know three years ago I had a heart attack. Uh, it, was, it was a surprise. I guess maybe a lot of people it is, uh, but I felt healthy. I thought I was, I was on top of the world. Uh, I've always wanted a swimming pool. So I had already begun, even a few years before that, to take a pick and shovel and start digging a hole in my yard. And that was my exercise. I go out, and that dirt is as hard as concrete. I'm not kidding. There are times that I took, I'm not, I'm not a weak person. I've always been uh, strong, strong. I've always been able to carry my weight, and even yours too if you needed a little bit of help. That's just all the ways the way that I felt. I'd take that pick, and I'd swing it down on that dirt, and it would bounce like concrete. Boom! Just shake me all over. So needless to say, <laughs> I'd been working on it for three years, and I still didn't have a hole dug, really. I had, uh, I had about a four-foot by eight-foot hole, and uh, that's not much to swim in. I thought I was healthy. We had come to the States to do what we're doing right now, uh, a furlough-type year, and uh, we had just gotten out of Mexico into Dallas, Texas, and that was on a Friday evening when we got to Dallas. On Sunday morning, I had a heart attack. Uh, I was stubborn. I thought I knew my body. I thought I knew I was healthy, and this was just something that would pass, 
And so I walked the floors for eight hours trying to find solace and help in antacids. And uh, I got to where we had chairs with no handles. My, my son, it was in my son's house, had one, and I would lay down on my chest, and it would move the pain a little bit to my back. And, uh, you know, and I said, well, if it was my heart, it wouldn't go to my back, you know. I just, so I just argued with myself for eight hours. And finally, when I couldn't take it anymore, I went, and they took a blood enzyme test and said, no, you're in the middle of a heart attack right now. I have no idea how long. Uh, those parts of my heart had not been receiving blood. Uh, when I was about to leave, well, it was Tuesday afternoon. That was on a Sunday. They put in two stents on Sunday. They put in another two stents on Tuesday. And on Tuesday afternoon, the second doctor that had, who was the specialist um, came and he was talking to me. And I said, I said, Doctor, this is September. In November, I have meetings. And I really need to be in these meetings and he, he looked at me, and he just he folded his hands in front of, me, of himself like that, and he said, Tim, you almost died in my hands. You cancel everything. <laughs> so, you know, that's quite the shock. It's quite the shock. But since then, the Lord has been dealing with me about my heart. And when we were leaving Mexico just this last time, and I had that small group of believers that I had there in my, uh, in, on my property there that we've, we've now begun, And uh, the Lord gave me some thoughts of what I wanted to share with them as I was leaving for the next several months. And what I desired, that if God would in some way show me his heart, and in some small way, as I said, be able to represent that as my heart toward my people. And this is what I shared with them on that day. And after that, God said, Tim... This is what I want you to share as you go around. As you go and you preach and you teach, I want you to share my heart as it can be represented through your heart. Now, I say in a small way and I'll repeat it in a small way because I in no way have the heart of God. Uh, His heart toward us is beyond measure. But he gave me a sense of some things that I think are very important for us a sense of what his heart is, how he feels toward us. Sometimes I think that um, I, I heard a statement one time, and if you, if you recognize the statement and you, you connect it with where it came from, that's okay. Um, but uh, there was a, a statement that I heard one time that said, when people are in darkness and light is shown to them, they lean toward the light. They look at it and lean toward the light. But as I begin to think about that, you know what the first reaction is when a person has been in darkness and all of a sudden sees the light? Now, they may be attracted toward the light, but the very first thing they do is they shrink away because it can be painful. And those who've been in darkness for a period of time can even have damage to their eyes, if not careful, by the sudden appearance of light. I find that the light of the gospel, the light of the word of God, many times finds reaction in us that at the very moment that it happens causes us to recoil. Now, if we allow ourselves to be affected by that light for an extended period of time, we will be drawn toward it. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. But the first exposure many times to truth causes a recoil, a reaction. I don't want what I say today to cause you to recoil or to react. I want you to lean toward the light. Now, I'm not going to say anything controversial. I'm not going to say anything outside of the realm of of what the Lord has in his word. But when we honestly look at the heart of God toward us, we should lean towards that light. We should allow God to continue to shine so that his word cleanses and purifies and chases the darkness away. In the United States of America, in the Southeast especially, 
and I have found almost to the same degree in the state of Pennsylvania, we are so accustomed to God's word and to preaching that many times we have become hardened to it once again. And we need to allow the heart of God to shine into our hearts and melt them so that we once again feel the very heart of God. If you would turn with me, please, to Jeremiah chapter 29. Let me see if that's where I want. Yes, Jeremiah 29. Now, I say in a joking manner that normally I speak with a half-page outline. Today I have three pages. Uh, I'm going to try to be quick, and I will be. Uh, Yes, I'm watching the time uh, visibly. I I see it back there. Actually, I wrote out some of the verses longhand, so it's the reason it took so much room. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Father, I thank you today for your word and for your goodness, for your graciousness to us. And I pray today, dear Jesus, that your word would penetrate our hearts and that we would see your heart and that we would warm to the light so that it might chase darkness out of our hearts and out of our lives. We ask, dear Jesus, for a special touch by your spirit so that the words become very real and our lives might be changed from this day forth. And we ask it in your name and for your sake. Amen. We're not recording, so it doesn't matter if I walk away from the mic. We are recording? Okay, okay, very good. Then I'll stay here. I have to hold on to the pulpit now. Years ago, I was reading in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, a very familiar portion of scripture. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The word in Spanish for mind there is the word sentir. Sentir has to do with the five senses as well as your feelings. It can be used for both. So everything that God experiences in his knowledge of us, is represented in that mind of Christ. And I am a very simple person. I always have to break complex ideas down into simple phrases so that I can understand it, so, and then that I can teach it. Uh, if, if we try to teach com- the, the complexities of the truth of God and the truth, truth of God's word, Uh, in its complexity, then we're going to lose a lot of people. We have to break it down so that the children in our presence can understand just as much as the more mature Christian can grow. So there's a great balance, and I need that's one of my, uh, always my goal, is to break complexities down into small bites. And I was going, I need to know this is something that has to be complex, Uh, has to have many different faces, has to have many different sides. And if we're not careful, it can be very confusing because we begin to not be able to put one in front of the other. What comes first? What comes second? What comes third? And so I begin to ask God, God, teach me in simple ideas what the mind of Christ is. And I begin in, the, in, in Philippians chapter 2. I read the rest of the New Testament, started in the Old Testament, came all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament again, and landed back after one year of studying, looking for the mind of Christ, came back to the book of Philippians, and there in the same passage where I was given a little outline that helped me understand what the mind of Christ was. I said that to say this, when I was going through the Old Testament, I found the mind of God. I found the heart of God. I am convinced that if you you and I were to study the Old Testament looking for his heart, 
looking for his mind. It would change the reading of the Old Testament and every word in the Old Testament, we would no longer say, well, that belongs here and that belongs there and, and, and these are the, the Israelis and we're the, uh, the church and, and there's a difference. But no, and I understand all of those things and all of those things are true. But when we study to find the heart of God, it all becomes personal. It all becomes that which I need to know how God thinks and wants and feels <coughs> about me. And so today we're going to be taking from the Old Testament and then balancing it with the new, the heart of God. I want in some way, if I may, this is a re re uh, repetition, for you to understand this is my heart for you today. This is my desire for you today. And as we look at this particular portion of Scripture, we find a great understanding of the heart of God. He says here in this verse once again, he says, uh, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you. You know, I live in a country where <clears throat> the people believe that God is angry at them for their sin. God is angry at sin. But they feel like God is angry with them because of their sin. And therefore, they can't go to God. It's like a child going to a, a parent who is extremely anger, angry. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Have you ever been that way with your children? Well, you didn't even know what to say. You're just, what in the world were they thinking? Do you think your child's going to come around at that moment and go, hey, daddy. That's their feeling. God is angry and he wants to send me to hell. He wants to punish me. They're told, they're taught. If you read this book, the Catholic priest will say, if you read this book by yourself, it will condemn you. And they're afraid of that. The truth is, yes, it will, but it also will save you. It gives us the message of salvation. It gives us the message of the love of God so much that he sent his son to die on Calvary's cross. The lady I was talking about in Sunday school, Letty, when we were touching on these things, she said, that's exactly how I always felt. So much so that they believe they have to go to the, to the mother of Jesus because Jesus being God is angry also. So they go to his mama, and he's not going to refuse his mama. So I'm going to go talk to Mary, and Mary's going to go to Jesus, and Jesus maybe might go to his father on my behalf. But we find that's not what Scripture teaches us at all. God says, for I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil. So point number one, I want us to understand this morning the heart of God. God desire, does not desire for you evil. It is not God's purpose to punish you. It is not God's purpose to cause your life to be stressful and to be hard. It is not God's purpose for you to be sad in life. Because he said, I know my heart. I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They're thoughts of peace. This world is looking for peace. Do you not agree? We're afraid at every moment that peace might escape us. And to be honest, the search for peace is what has caused such division in our country today. Seems to be opposite ends. But they, uh, they misunderstand peace. I think I'll be at peace if everybody in this world always smiles at me and gives me a kiss on my cheek and hugs my neck. But we as parents know that's not always the expression of love. Sometimes there's discipline. Sometimes they're skint knees when you're trying to walk. 
Sometimes you bump your head. Sometimes there are things that happen in our life that gives us the ability to grow and to understand. And God is saying, just as if we were to use that child as, as an example today, as they were walking down. I don't need to hold on to the pulpit, I'm sorry. As they were falling down, it is God's arms when we fall down that reach down and pick us up. In the midst of the storm, I wrote a track <clears throat> on uh, the way, John 14. In Spanish, it's out there on the table, I believe. And one of the illustrations that I give was a story my dad used to tell from the pulpit. So, you know, 61 years later, uh, I'll tell it in my way. I don't know if I tell it exactly in his way or not. But there was a competition between artists. And the competition or the goal was to paint a portrait of peace. To interpret peace on the painting. And there were those that painted great pastures of, of blowing grasses and birds and flying to the sky and fluffy, uh, fluffy clouds in the sky and, and a very tranquil looking place. Others with, with uh, a mother hen over her, over her little chicks and how she is protecting them and, and showing peace. And there were many different ideas. But you know the painting that won was the one that had a bird having made a nest in the side of a cliff on the shoreline of the ocean with storms howling around about her. And in that little crevice, in that little spot, in that rock, she was there with her family asleep. That's the peace God gives. In the midst of a troubled world, we find peace in Him. That's his desire for us. He really doesn't want us to be in the middle of a pasture with everything going, or at least it's not going to happen. But he does promise that in the midst of the storm, I will be with you. I will take care of you. You have my presence. You have my goodness. You have my heart. For I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. You see, God has a plan for our life. And that plan may very well take us through storms. It may, may very well take us through shipwrecks. It may very well take us through moments of weakness in our health. Death of family members. Moments that are extremely difficult for the human man and human woman to reconcile. But he said, my thoughts towards you, my heart, is that you find peace. That you go through those circumstances with me by your side. Where I am constantly there to pick you up and to carry you when necessary. To give strength to your legs when you must walk. Strength to your arms when you must battle. This are, these are my thoughts. Isn't it wonderful to have an almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, who cares for me? Isn't it a wonderful thing to think that this God, this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, Thinks about me. Look at the very first phrase. And I love this. It says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. He thinks about me. I'm fully convinced that on the day of creation, when he formed with his own hands Adam and Eve, that he thought of Timothy Hendricks. He knew one day through that creation I was to come into this world. And all of the plans that he had developed from day one and even before. <clears throat> he thought of me. I am persuaded that on the day that he hung between heaven and earth. 
and he paid for the sins of mankind. That it wasn't mankind he was thinking of. It was Timothy Hendricks he was thinking of. His thoughts were about me. For I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Wow, what a God we serve. What a love he expresses toward us. And I know that in the Old Testament we have this God that, that orders that, that ex- entire civilizations be eradicated and that, and that set lines. And we're going to see some of those lines in just a moment. And he, began, and he, he presents himself as a harsh taskmaster. And yet, he wants us to understand his heart. I think about you. My thoughts thoughts towards you are for peace and not for evil. And he has an expected end. He has a plan for us. That he's developed a plan that is best for us. I say many times, and I believe it with all my heart, That I can tell you when God called me to missions. And I can give you a scripture verse that he used to concrete that in my heart. I can tell you testimony of the moment that God called me to Mexico. And I can give you scripture that God used to concrete that in my heart. I am not a special person. God has a plan for all of us, each and every one. Can you do the same for me? Can you tell me the moment that God concreted in your heart with his word, his desire for you to be here in Pennsylvania, in Warriors Mark? If not, how do you know you're doing what God wants you to do? I don't know what you do in work. But can you show me scripturally with testimony how God spoke to you and said, I want you in this line of business. I'm not talking about convenience. I'm not talking about ability. I'm not talking about all of the different things that we use to critique our lives. I'm talking about God's will for your life. He has an expected end for you. Have you searched his mind? Have you searched his heart? Have you found his plan and looked for his confirmation in his word? We can only enjoy the fullness of the heart of God if we are in his will. We can only experience the greatest peace that God has for us if we are obeying him as his children. But we must understand, this is the only way this decision can be made. God's thoughts toward me are for peace. He's got my best in his heart. Therefore, I can trust his plan, not my plan. So the first passage that we've seen today, we understand the heart of God. That he thinks about me, that he wants my peace. He has a plan for me. Now let's go to Joshua chapter 24. Again, another familiar portion of scripture. Joshua chapter 24. And verse 15. The Bible says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Number two, the heart of God desires for us to serve him. God's desire is that we serve him. I grew up in the States. My dad, as I said, was a pastor. I've been in churches 
all my life. From the first Sunday after I was born, I was in church. And I've been there, I've, I've worn a tie, I think, since that day. In fact, if someone would just stitch one around my neck, it'd probably be easier. I went to Mexico, and all the men there, they didn't grow up like I did necessarily. And as soon as, as, soon as they could, they took their ties off, and, and then they stopped wearing them to church. And, you know, and I, that's fine. They wear these real nice shirts that are Latino, and, and, and that's all well and good. I don't have any problem with that. But for me, it's my tie. I don't have any problem with it. I enjoy putting a tie and suit on. But I have seen that while people really, really, really do enjoy coming to church, their lives outside of church are just like everybody else's. Oh, there's some differences. I'm not saying that, that you live like the world lives. But our ideas, our overriding ideas is to serve ourselves. Money, possessions, family. And it is our responsibility to provide for our family. It is our responsibility to do everything that we can in order that they might have better lives. So many times I feel like that we believe that their benefit comes from our work and not from the Lord. Now, excuse me, that's what I said about the light. Sometimes we go, whoa, wait a minute, that's not me. Maybe not, I don't know. But I can assure you as I have traveled around. Cities and towns aren't much changed. Again, a, a, an example of my dad. It's the only thing that I have except for myself. And I won't, don't like using myself. <clears throat> but dad started a church when I was two in a small town in northern Florida. Alabama was a dry state. You know what that is, don't you? Didn't sell alcohol. Florida was a wet state. So that first mile after you crossed the Alabama-Florida line, all it was was bars and red light district. That's all it was. Dad went a block off Main Street, started a small church. Before eight years were up, there were no bars. There was no red light district. There were families and there was the church. And dad said as an invited guest on the council, the city council. And always was able to give counsel, not a vote, but counsel to those men sitting there. We don't see that much anymore. We don't see that much anymore. Joshua was standing before the group of the Israelis there, the Hebrew people, and he said, listen. Choose you today whom you're going to serve. Choose you today not to serve the old ways. I am very fortunate. I was born into the home of a Baptist minister. I knew and understood God's love for me and the sacrifice of God's son very early. At the age of five, I accepted him as my savior. Not all people have that testimony. Some of you know what your life was like before Christ. How you lived, how you thought, where you went. The difficulties and dangers that presented themselves in your lives. The Hebrew children, they got to a point, they said, Hey, why did we leave Egypt? We had it good back there. No, they didn't. They were in slavery. And they were in slavery to the point that they were abused, murdered, and hindered in worshiping God. But they got to a point in their journey that they said, why did we ever leave Egypt? Joshua is saying here to the Hebrew children, listen, you can go back and start serving those same gods. That's your choice. Or... You can serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Today, can I say with no no expectation that I'm wrong at all, 
that the gods of this life that we live right now are prevalent in our churches today? They are prevalent prevalent in our lives today? We have chosen to blend. I have heard from people all around me, people I love. This is the 21st century. You can't do that the same way anymore. It's got to change. You've got to adapt a little bit. No, you don't. God doesn't call us to adapt. God calls us to make a difference. Joshua was telling the people there, you can serve the gods back in Egypt again if that's what you want. You can choose to serve the gods, the new gods that are in the land in which you dwell, of the Amorites. But he said, for me, my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. And then we will end with Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Just back a few pages. And verse 19. Now this beginning of this verse is going to make the same choice, the same clear choice that you just saw in Joshua. So many times we believe God to be this God. As Joshua presented him, listen, you can go back and serve the gods that were in Egypt. You can serve the gods that are in your present land, but I'm going to serve the Lord. In other words, God says there's a choice to be made. Toughen up. Man up. Make the choice. It says here in this verse, in verse 19. Let me see where I am right here. Um... 30 and verse 19. Here we go. Uh, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Boy, that just seems to put a harsh face on God, does it not? I call heaven and earth to record today. Somebody's taking notes. The heaven that was created by God, the earth that was created by God, they're listening. The universe is watching. And I call you against yourself to make a decision. Now, it really doesn't seem to show us the heart of God, just the decision of God. I know I've done my children that way at times. I have said, listen, I don't want you doing this. If you do it, whatever it might be, you will be punished. I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be ruling over you. But as I leave and come back again, I want to see that you have chosen to do the right thing. Is that not what this verse says? I call you to record today. I want you to stand up. I want you to pay attention. I want you to understand that I'm putting a line in the sand right now and you and heaven and earth is going to be writing this down. This is important. I I honestly believe, friends, that although we're not Catholic, And although we have a proper understanding of the word of God, we live our lives under the assumption that this is God's heart. No, this is God's action. This is what he presents before us. And he says as we follow on down through here, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death. If you will allow me, I am going to use this, and I think it's proper, but I'm going to use this to talk about life eternal and death eternal. Jesus, on the cross, drew a line in the sand. He said, you choose me or you choose death. 
It's your choice. God gave man the choice. I, I trust that we understand that. There is such a movement today that seems to take away the choice of man and place all of the proof on the sovereignty of God. God did not give up his sovereignty when he gave me the choice. Just like he did not give up his deity when he became a man. He's God. He can do that. I don't know how. I don't know how he, he can balance those two things in his mind, but he said, listen, I give you the choice today, life or death. I don't know you. I don't know your heart. Not been around enough to know if there is a real conversion there or not, if you have really made the choice for Jesus or not. But if you're here today and you have not, God is calling you to record today. Make a choice. Make a choice. Do you want to live eternally or do you want to die in hell eternally? You have the choice. You can stand up and say, yes, I believe that Jesus died for me and I want him to save me and forgive me of my sins. Please, Lord Jesus, save me. I choose you. Now, I'm not going into all the doctrine of the grace of God that brings us to that point, but the choice is yours. And he did not give up his sovereignty when he gave you that choice. He's still God. But the choice is life and death. It is also blessing and cursing. Now I have spent a great deal of today talking about choosing to serve God. Choosing to serve him in all that we do. Having in our hearts and minds the one foremost thought that everything I say, everything I do, everything I eat, everything I drink, everything that pertains to my life, I want to please God. I want to serve Him. If we choose to serve Him, He has promised us a life of blessing. If as His children we choose to disobey, we can only expect the, His hand of chastisement. That is the choice that is set before us today. As his children, do you want a life of blessing? Serve him. Do you want a, a life of cursing? Choose disobedience. But the message that I have to, for you today from my heart and from the heart of God is found in this verse. Because although he sets these strict guidelines, although he says you can choose life, death, you can choose blessing, cursing, you have the ability to choose, he almost falls down on his face before us and he begins to cry out, choose life, choose life, choose me, choose blessing. His heart begins to pour out as he begins to plead with us, do what's right, serve me, love me, choose me. That's the message that I have this morning. God's heart, although the lines are made clear and God gives us the ability to choose, his heart for us is that we choose him. Can you not feel the love of God pouring out of his heart as he falls on his knees before us, having given us the, the extremities of our choice, but he says, please choose right. Please choose me. Please serve me. Choose life. Choose blessing. Choose service. What heart? It became very real to me three years ago. I don't know if I'll be able to come back here one day. Who knows? May have another heart attack. May die in a car wreck. All of these things are in God's hands. But I want you to know my heart for you. That you choose life. That you choose blessing. That you choose to serve God. That you choose to love him. That everything in your being leans toward the light. And not recoils from it. 
I trust that I've been able to express this morning God's heart. And in some small way, my heart for you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. I'm going to turn the service over to the pastor in just a moment. But I don't want to dilute the word of God by saying, God's just going to smile and say everything's okay. No, he gives us choices. I plead with you today to choose life, to choose blessing, to choose service. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your love to us. We ask, dear Jesus, that you conquer our hearts, that we submit our hearts so that our heart and your heart will be so enjoined that people can see Christ, your son, in us. We ask these things in your name. Amen.